As a listener of Amicus, you know that the Supreme Court is eroding the wall between church and state, brick by brick. What you might not know is how a Baptist group fights for both religion clauses of our First Amendment, protecting that wall of separation. The Respecting Religion podcast is hosted by Amanda Tyler and Holly Holman, two Baptist advocates and constitutional attorneys. If you're worried about Christian nationalism, authoritarian theocracy, and the misuse of the term religious freedom to harm others, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Whether you're selling a little or a lot... Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. From the launch your online shop stage, all the way to the we just hit a million orders stage. No matter what stage you're in, Shopify's there to help you grow. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash special offer, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash special offer. The counter-narrative cannot simply be, well, the court will get him. It's not going to work. It's not going to work politically, and it's not going to work legally, we now know. Hi, and welcome to Amicus. This is Slate's podcast about the law and the rule of law and the law of Donald Trump and the courts. I'm Dahlia Lithwick. I cover these topics at Slate, and we have somehow, I don't know how, ambled our way right on into April, which will see the last argument weeks of this Supreme Court term. This last few days has been a hodgepodge of Donald Trump bond stories, threats to judges and their families, filings in Trump trials seeking more delays, and the endless grinding of gears in the Mar-a-Lago stolen documents case. The last week also saw Florida attempting to leapfrog way out ahead of Texas in terms of restrictions on abortion care. Now, this week, we are unveiling an exciting new feature for our Slate Plus listeners, your very own separate bonus episode. In this, our maiden voyage for the all-new separate Amicus Saturday Plus conversation, subscribers are going to get to hear from our very own Mark Joseph Stern about the Florida Supreme Court's big predictive abortion rulings and about a South Carolina gerrymander that is still not resolved at SCOTUS. If you would like to listen, but you're not yet a member, go to slate.com slash amicus plus, or if you're listening via Apple Podcasts, you can click try free at the top of our show page. This week's show was inspired by a whole lot of rule of law and law of Trump mayhem that has happened in recent days. As journalists and as lawyers vie for hotel rooms in lower Manhattan, to cover the now almost certain April 15th start of Donald Trump's criminal trial over hush money payments and campaign finance violations in the 2016 election. Trump threatens judges and their families. Judge Juan Mershon imposes gag orders that Trump apparently receives more as campaign performance indicators than legal prohibitions to be taken seriously. All of this happens while the former and hopeful future president has been rustling up money for bond payments with who knows what strings attach and to whom. So it felt like high time to talk to one of the smartest people that I know when it comes to these swirling issues of vigilante violence and stochastic terror and national security. Juliet Kayam is perfectly positioned to guide us through a discussion of national security and this 2024 election. She's the Robert and Renee Belfer Senior Lecturer and Faculty Chair of the Homeland Security and Security and Global Health Projects at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. She served as President Obama's Assistant Secretary for Intergovernmental Affairs at the Department of Homeland Security. She's a national security analyst for CNN and a frequent contributor to The Atlantic. Juliet's most recent book is The Devil Never Sleeps, Learning to Live in an Age of Disasters. It was published in 2022. Juliet, welcome. Do you sleep? I do. I had a horrible night last night, though, actually, when I think about it. But um, I generally do, and I am the queen of naps. And I know that the literature is all over the place on naps, but... Actually, as you know, we both had crazy days. It was hard to get this hour in. But I literally am planning a nap in two hours because I have to go out tonight. Oh, my God. 
You got a nap. It sounds so dulcet when you say it. So so listen, the last time you and I were on this show together, we talked about Trump and stochastic terror. It was right after January 6th. You were actually teaching us the word stochastic terror. And here we are. And it's three years later. And the former president is now the Republican nominee for president. And he has thus far evaded all criminal prosecution. His campaign seems to mostly be focused on staying out of court, staying out of jail. And he seems to be, as you've been tweeting, pretty regularly directing his followers to commit acts of violence as he makes very explicit plans to commit acts of violence should he ever gain office. So, Juliet, everything we believed about stopping this sequence of events from happening right here, right now, seems to have gained like a lot of traction and no results. So talk to me about what we have come from and where we are heading, please. Yeah. So this was not inevitable. So if I was naive the last time we spoke in January of 2021, it wasn't believing for that brief moment that the isolation of Donald Trump would hold. I'm a contributor now for The Atlantic, so I I wrote a piece for them January I think it came out the 11th and it was, you know, it was just conceiving of Trump as a leader of a terrorist organization and then conceiving of the fight against him as a counterterrorism effort. And it was, I think, viewed as like, oh, who talks like that then? Right. And we didn't know everything that had gone on with January 6th, but it was just a way of thinking about, okay, well, what he does is he uses this language. He tries to hide from it. At least then he tried to hide from it, pretend like he wasn't inciting, saying it was a joke, saying he didn't really mean it, using vague language. But it was clear what he was doing. And that isolation was, we forget this, that isolation was a a combination of the chorus of what the GOP once was, isolating him. It was Biden was president. It was the prosecutions of hundreds now of his minions, it was the trials or cases that are going on. And um, you look back and you think, is there a moment? I don't want to give too much credit to McConnell, but I do think McConnell folding, he originally had condemned Trump and now says he's going to endorse him, was a more significant moment in U.S. history than we give it credit for. I think McConnell had the ability to get the elders and others to behave and continue Trump's isolation. We forget what it was like in January, February, March. So he then realizes he's got free. He then creates this narrative of victimization. I don't view the legal fight and all the legal cases, I don't think of them in terms of results. Is he guilty? Is he not guilty? Is it delayed? Is it not delayed? I think of it in terms of calling it out. I think the more that we can do through all sorts of different platforms in which you're just trying to weaken the overall hold that he has, not on his supporters, we'll never get them, but on the American public. Is that going to work? It requires the media to do its job correctly and, and begin to call this out. But despite his support in the polls and stuff, what I'm amazed at is that he has nothing left but violence, where violence was the background noise. Now it's at the forefront. Well, then I think there's a way, I hope, that is in some ways because of the exposure, right? I mean, he he can't hide it anymore. And now he just totally owns it. It's not stochastic terrorism anymore. It's incitement. It's not like, what did Trump mean when he said it's going to be wild. Like now it's like a picture of Biden with a bullet in his head. Like there's like a difference. So I actually stopped using the term. To me, it's just pure incitement. And we prepare, we're results oriented in this election. What is about to happen and what is happening leading up to November and then November to January is like nothing we'll ever see again. I think. Yeah, it's so interesting. I, my next question was going to be about um, after, you know, the former president posts this video of, you know, an image of President Biden and he's hogtied on the tailgate of a truck like he'd been kidnapped. And, you know, your tweet was all Trump has left as a strategy is violence, right? We have moved past stochastic terror. This is a, a call to violence. And yet 
I'm thinking about two things that I want you to reflect on. One is you have always said, and I know you said it before, you know, when there were threats that there was going to be violence and vigilantism outside the courthouses at some of the civil trials. And you've been on record over and over, I think, fairly credibly saying there isn't a, an infrastructure for this. Like, there's some lone nutters. But if all those prosecutions of all those, you know, sort of low-hanging fruit from January 6th taught us anything, it's that there aren't quite so many people who think, hey, you know, I'll just saddle up and go kill someone because there's been consequences. The other thing that I think you're saying, but tell me if you're saying something different, is that if the 2022 election taught us anything, Juliet, it's that people kind of like democracy. They like rule of law. And so you're just going to hit pretty quickly a ceiling of people who want to be incited and act on it. Yeah, that's exactly right. A counterterrorism campaign is measured differently than, say, is he popular in the polling? And we can debate the polling and how strong it is or, or what it's it's telling us. But you measure an ideology by simply, is it gaining strength or is it weakening? And if you just look at sort of violent extremism, there is a lot to be nervous about. I'm not Pollyanna. People get a high sort of saying that the threat is much bigger than it is. I, I'm just looking at the numbers. He is unable to get crowds in the way he used to. He is unable to launch the kind of violence that I think in his head he anticipates. And so what you're seeing is he has to push the envelopes. Why is he going so batshit, sorry, so crazy? I mean, I just think sometimes we're like, forget that he's running for president. This is like an adult male behaving this way. And you would not view this as sane and I don't even need to diagnose him, right? If you just gave me the metrics of what he's doing. So, so what's happening is he's responding to the lack of response. That's how I view this. And so you're just constantly pushing it. And what the counter narrative has to be, and this is where I beg my legal friends too, is the counter narrative cannot simply be, well, the court will get him. It's not going to work. It's not going to work politically. And it's not going to work legally, we now know. You know, there's lots of smart legal people being like, this is the case. This is the one. And I'm like, really? Because I've been hearing that for four years and it's not the case. It is what I see, let's just put it this way, is there is a strong counterterrorism, pro-democracy element that is why Trump is going down this path. So when I say, and I wrote earlier, like, all Trump has as a galvanizing force now is, is violence or the threat of violence is because that's all who's left. He's not trying to recruit anymore. And so I'm beginning to think, I don't know how I prove this, but, you know, I'm beginning to think that this is Trump's campaign not to win, but it's his Trump's campaign about how to lose, that he also realizes it's close. He could lose. And if anybody thinks this man is going away in anything but death, that's the only way this this ends, I believe, then dream on. And I think 2024, if he loses, you know, November to January of 2024, Biden, my argument will be when I write it, uh, is, you know, Biden better have a plan. This is a, this is a losing strategy as much as it is a winning strategy. Juliet, you have so perfected the ability to say incredibly cheerful things in chipper ways while simultaneously, you know, warning that the end times are nigh. I, I like to think that's my superpower, but you really leave me in the dust. Someone said to me the other day, like, you like give medicine with a lot of sugar. And I was like, <laughs> it's not, well, I mean, it's just, it's, you know, what, what's the alternative sometimes I feel, but like, I'm, I'm seeing metrics in my world. The lawyers see metrics they don't like, the delays, the whatever, the losses, whatever. But I'm I'm looking at this. I'm not looking at polls. I'm just looking at the 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 violent extremism side. And this is not what Trump wants. This is not what Trump wants. We are taking a short break. This episode is brought to you by NetSuite. Quick math. The less your business spends on operations, on multiple systems, on delivering your product or service, the more margin you have and the more money you keep. But with higher expenses on materials, employees, distribution, and borrowing, everything costs more. 
So, to reduce costs and headaches, smart businesses are graduating to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, bringing accounting, financial management, inventory, HR into one platform and one source of truth. With NetSuite, you reduce IT costs because NetSuite lives in the cloud with no hardware required, accessed from anywhere. You cut the cost of maintaining multiple systems because you've got one unified business management suite. You improve efficiency by bringing all your major business processes into one platform, slashing manual tasks and errors. Over 37,000 companies have already made the move, so do the math, see how you'll profit with NetSuite. By popular demand, NetSuite has extended its one-of-a-kind flexible financing program for a few more weeks. Head to netsuite.com slash amicus, netsuite.com slash amicus, netsuite.com slash amicus. This episode of Amicus is sponsored by 5-4, Dissecting Supreme Court Tightly Split Decisions, a new book by former Justice Frank Sullivan and Indiana University McKinney Law School professor Nicholas Georgiakopoulos. After stepping down from the Indiana Supreme Court, Justice Frank Sullivan and fellow Indiana University McKinney Law School professor Nicholas Georgiakopoulos embarked on an eight-year collaboration that culminated in this new book. Now, to the joy of Supreme Court watchers everywhere, you can order 5-4 Dissecting Supreme Court Tightly Split Decisions from Amazon. Sullivan and Georgiakopoulos explore these decisions from fresh angles and cover topics like changing majority coalitions, red scare decisions, super dissenters, and more. The book even includes fold-out posters that visualize historic swing votes and lay out the summaries of decisions issued by each side. It's a treasure trove for court watchers. Geek your heart out with 5-4 Dissecting Supreme Court Tightly Split Decisions by George Akopoulos and Sullivan. Order from Amazon for delivery. 5-4 by George Akopoulos and Sullivan. Let's get back to my conversation with Juliet Kayam about national security and the 2024 election. So I want to stay on the incitement for one more beat, and then I would love for you to kind of tell us what metrics you're looking at and what they're showing. But, you know, this week also was a kind of a harrowing week because, you know, we've got Trump leveling what looked like, again, actual threats, you know, actual incitement against Judge Juan Mershon overseeing the criminal case in Manhattan, threats... (laughs) Kind of, again, those vague, like, I'm just joking, threats against his adult daughter. We've got gag order. Then the judge expanded the gag order. And, you know, Trump's lawyers uh, do two moves. You know, one is they're saying, oh, this is free speech. You know, he's just protesting the fact that the judge didn't, you know, recuse himself. Oh, and by the way, Trump went ahead and, and violated the new gag order on Tuesday. So I guess... I'm asking you the question in some sense you've already answered, which is in the fury that we are seeing, which is why aren't the courts doing something, right? They should put him in jail. Why hasn't a judge just like thrown him in the clink and thrown out the key? And your answer is the justice system is not going to fix this. No, at least not now. It may be after this election. But I said long ago I think progressives and Democrats, like me, I'm a Democrat, you know, we should be content, maybe not satisfied, but content enough if this ends with Trump completely isolated with his bozos in Florida, dying alone with wife number five. And the idea that the, because I think about measures of success, I'm in disaster management, like the, the idea that the only measure of success is him in an orange suit is like ridiculous. First of all, democracy has many swords. I always think about this. Like it, it can't just be the law is going to save us. It is going to be citizenry. It's going to be smart, smart reporters or reporting on this. It is going to be financial as we're starting to see. It is going to be people simply watching walking away from the madness. And I guess the last metric when you say, how do I measure? And that this thing isn't growing. That really, it wasn't obvious that 
he wouldn't be able to launch the kind of worries or violence that we have. The Proud Boys are gone. The Oath Keepers are gone. Yes, they metamorphosis, but someone who comes out of counterterrorism, they're not getting bigger. They've turned on each other. They can't raise money. And you can't recruit if everyone thinks you're going to end up in jail. He can't make any of those promises right now. So I do think that leading into this, it's just a lot better and we keep doing it. But I I just long ago was, you know, whether this is a failure of our democracy or just the nature of democracy, like this one fell swoop of victory against this guy is just not the way to think about it. But I would say the GOP could have helped. They had so many lifelines, so many off-ramps. I mean, from January 6th and those weeks to famously the January 6th commission, the special commission that literally used Republican witnesses to guide the leadership of the GOP to a path of we can isolate this guy. So I know it's frustrating that this all falls on Democrats. And if I hear another Republican semi-blaming Democrats for this, I'm going to be like, yeah, no, that doesn't work that way. Does not work that way. They abdicated their responsibility to our democracy, to uh, Democrats and moderate Republicans and and no Trump Republicans. And uh, those who did not join those forces own this in the same way that the Oath Keepers own it. Exactly the same. There's no gap in my mind. So you're saying a version of what I feel like I've been saying, which is while there is like tremendous recreational enjoyment in pinning all this on Merrick Garland, pinning all this on Jack Smith, insisting that Sonia Sotomayor should retire, pinning all this on Judge Mershon, being mad at the D.C. Circuit for taking too long. Uh, The fact of the matter is, like, this is how the rule of law works. It was never going to be an episode of Law and Order. And I think what you're saying is there are other swords. And I would love for you to talk about, um, if you don't mind, like when you say, okay, holy shit, there are some scary things that are going to happen between November and January. I would love you to just just walk you through that. Yeah. Okay. So there's three periods. Like, you know, I always I always talk in threes with you. There's three periods I worry about. Okay. So now until November. Okay. So this we know already because we've been promised it, which is just going to be violence or the threat of violence is sort of the extension of the electoral process. And that's going to focus on election workers, judges, and others. And we're already seeing this. He's already trying to do this. We're not seeing anything organized. So there's not like it's 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 the randoms. The randoms can be scary, but it's not like a movement that is unmanageable. So that just means greater efforts to protect courthouses and judges. It involves a, a, a an alphabet of federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies, including intelligence sharing, including threat assessments. Now, the good news is, is this is likely confined to six states. Like it's not like like the entire, so I'm going to try to make this manageable. It's like in Massachusetts, there might be crazies, but like, you know, we know who wins, right? It's going to be Arizona and North Carolina and Georgia and a few other, and Michigan and a few other swing states. So that's what I worry about leading up to the date. Period two is between the election day and when someone is called. That, that will be um, insane if it's not called in the first day. And that's going to be Biden is in charge of the federal apparatus. Governors have their own law enforcement statuses. And we better be ready for that. We better be ready to take states to court that are using state law enforcement in violation of due process and the protection of laws of equal access and be ready. Like, this is the thing that, like, we need Biden to own this. The third period then is who wins. So let's say it's Trump. You know, I can't be rosy about this. I don't, you know, do the institutions hold? I doubt it. Like, I think that this is a once in a lifetime um, election, once in a, a nation time election. Um, I am more confident in the American public based on a variety of metrics. We're not seeing a lot of this campaign if you're in a swing, st- if you're in a in a blue state. You're not seeing what's happening in North Carolina and the and the local and state elections that are that are combining marijuana legalization with you know anti Dobbs. Like that's the best combination to get the voters out. The third then is once it's so if once it's called, as I said, so if it's Trump, I won't sugarcoat it. I just I don't know what happens and whether the institutions hold and one hopes that you're ready. And you're and I read that article about California, blue states preparing for his potential win in terms of protecting their state priorities. 
if Biden wins, then we have to anticipate that Trump, he only has two narratives left. One is he's in jail. The other is he's victim. And he's going to pick the latter. And the only way you can be a victim, right, or the one way that you create this narrative is to create a lot of mayhem. And that scenario, I think we're not talking about enough, is that Biden, actually, I know it's hard for people to imagine, but like Biden, yes, Biden very much could win. Like, um, And how Trump continues to uh, be Trump. And the only thing he has then is bring it all down, right? I mean, we know that and we know that now. So how do we protect ourselves through a variety of means? And what's interesting, I should say, is the January 6th report, which is 800 pages, you know, it's going to be most famous for its accounting of what happened in January 6th and whatever. It actually has a series of really interesting recommendations at the end. Some of them are legal in terms of enhanced sentencing, but others are about intelligence sharing and other efforts that Biden really could own that we really ought to be ready for. We're going to pause now to hear from our great sponsors. Our sponsor for this episode is Pilot.com, accountants specializing in small law firms. Pilot's team of full-time U.S.-based accountants take your firm's bookkeeping off your plate so you always have a clear picture of your financial health. But bookkeeping is just the beginning. Their fractional CFOs work with you to help you run a more efficient firm with strategies to help you increase utilization and stay on top of your billings. And that's why thousands of organizations across the U.S. work with them today. Look, we all know that this isn't the most exciting topic in the world. You didn't become a lawyer to nerd out on accounting, but you know how important it is to get this right. And if you have the experts at pilot.com taking care of this, that frees you up to do what you do best. So if you're looking for a thought partner who can help make your firm more profitable, or if you just want someone who you know is going to do the work right, check them out at pilot.com slash amicus. That's pilot.com slash amicus. We are going to pause now to hear from some of our great, great sponsors on this week's show. And that includes our friends at BetterHelp. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. A lot of us spend a lot of our lives wishing we had more time. The question is, time for what? If time were unlimited... How would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you and make it a priority. Therapy can help you find what matters to you so that you can do more of it. Being in therapy, especially now when things are hard and you might feel immobilized, being in therapy is a really, really good way to not be alone in your head. If you are thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your own schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash amicus today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash amicus. More now with Juliet Kayam on how the courts cannot be the only plan for protecting democracy from Donald Trump. Is it your sense, Juliet, that I always wonder about this, that there are tons of great brains in think tanks, wargaming all this and making plans and that I just don't know about them? Yes, there are. There are. My public push is that Biden should be more public about it because one of the things I feel, and remember, I'm I'm thinking about this through Homeland Security vectors. I have long felt that if the National Guard had been out on the Hill, if the intelligence had been shared about what they thought the threat environment was, because remember, we knew by the night before, because you just saw the number of people coming, that 
90% of those people would have dispersed. I really believe it. And actually, maybe the Oath Keepers, those guys are such wusses. Like, they might have even been nervous. It was the failure to anticipate it that allowed it to move on. And I don't want to forgive any of the January 6th defendants, but, the, you know, you've seen the cases. There's scales. Like, there, you know, there are people who just, like, you don't agree with their politics, but, like, they got swept up. They should serve time or whatever, but like, I'm not going to put in jail for 15 years, right? So that is happening. I'd like it to be more public. Also, I will say, can we just focus as a, as I don't even want to call us a party as a, we're just a democracy movement at this stage. We're, we're not Democrat or Republican. This is just a democracy movement. Um, whining about Merrick Garland and... <laughs> And various judges who are there for life and the amount of ink that's spent and the outrage at them. It's just like, I get it. And I get it's good to expose whatever might have been, but that's not going to solve. We're in a threat environment right now. We're not looking back. So I focus. Let's focus. Juliet, last week's show, we talked a lot about Leonard Leo yeah. and the 2025 project and this. Oh, my God. I had never heard of it before. I have to tell you. Can I just do an aside quickly? Yes. When you and I were growing up or when, when you and I were in <laughs> law school and like the heritage was like, not this. When did that happen? I must have stopped paying attention because all of a sudden, like a year ago, I'm like starting to hear what's coming out of heritage. I'm like, what? Like, that was, that's crazy. Yeah, I would say the same. I don't know about you, but even the Federalist Society, when I was going to law school, was just like a lot of jaunty bow ties and better drinks. Like, that's kind of the totality of it. It wasn't like total world domination. But it's certainly taken a turn. And if we take seriously any part of this, you know, like any part of it, it's extremely serious, and it does raise this question for me that I always want to ask you, which is how much of this is Trump and how much of it is, even if it were not Trump, <laughs> if it were the next person, because the party apparatus is now on board for a thing that may or may not transcend Trump? No, I mean, I, the analogy is not fair, uh, but I want to say if he's defeated— it will be hard for you to find many Trump supporters. They're, I mean, they're going to be Nikki Haley's everywhere, right? It's going to be Nikki Haley's everywhere. Like, he like, oh, what, you know, yeah, I guess I supported him at some stage, but whatever. It is, you know, I tell my Republican students, I teach at the Kennedy School, like, you know, they don't have a party right now and they're very invested in the Never Trump movement and all the organizations that are doing it. And, and I said, like, this is against interest, but if as a democracy party, we can beat this guy, the Republican Party is going to have to figure itself out. Remember when Obama beat McCain, the future of the Republican Party was not Trump. It was not, remember the um, the Tea Partiers. It was Bobby Jindal. Remember him? Right. Yeah, the governor of Louisiana. He was a children of immigrant, I think Yale Law School Road Scholar. He was like there. And, you know, this party has a capacity to, I think, figure it out. I don't think this is permanent, but I think it's going to require the Republicans, as you're seeing in the Never Trump movement, and even Nikki Haley to a certain extent, to truly banish it. I want to be super clear that I'm hearing you right. You're saying that the personhood stuff goes away and the putting all the migrants in detention camps goes away and all of the most like really nefarious threats that are coming from Heritage and from Leonard Leo and coming from, you know, all of the folks who seem to be willing to use Trump transactionally, but they would use Nikki Haley transactionally. All that goes away. Look at the Koch, look at the Koch brothers. The, who did they give money to? They, I mean, they, these people don't believe in anything but winning. And he's going to have, if he loses, they're going to have to figure out how do they win. Well, that, they win by figuring out how do you build a coalition that gets other groups in that aren't crazy. I mean, you know, the, the I mean, we didn't talk about this, this is not my lane, but like the abortion cases like Alabama, Florida now, like that's not a winning strategy if you just look at, the, at where the American population is. And, and the reason why I was criticizing heritage was 
their gender stuff. It's not just abortion. Like they've got some weird, like like Stepford stuff in oh, there. Yeah. Like divorce, Stepford wife no stuff. fault, divorce, and yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah like yeah. it's like it's like really in like the guise of feminism. It's just like really, you know, it's like kind of creepy. I think <laughs> it's like a little bit, you know. But you know, I'm not I'm not interested in saving this party. I'm interested in, in eviscerating Trump. And if we could just focus on that and and not expect much from the GOP as it now stands, and then if this goes well and you can get this coalition to stay together. You know, Trump who will be the narrative. I, I I lived in South Africa. You can't meet a single white person in their 60s or 70s who voted for apartheid. They didn't exist, apparently. They there was apparently there was no no one who wanted apartheid, right? If history moves forward, people will pretend like they were with it the whole time. So so the other thing I really wanted to to um pick out a little bit with you, Juliet, is this bond money psychodrama, right? Because this, again, has some of your, you know, counterterrorism, counterintelligence flavor. And again, I think we've been sort of watching it like spectators, like, ooh, ah, does he have the money? He doesn't have the money. Does he have the money? You know, Tish James carrying out the gold toilets from Trump Tower. And it's all like spectator sport, but like it does distract from, I think, the question that I know you're a big napper, but like might keep you awake, which is who is handing over money to Donald Trump and what do they want in exchange for it? It's so funny you say that because that was like the piece that I wrote recently, which was just, we're looking this through the lens of the U.S. legal system. We need to look at it through the lens of this is a freaking national security threat. What we do know is that Qatar, which houses Hamas, which, you know, I... I mean, just listening to Trump, I don't believe a word he says, but like, you know, oh, you know, the, the, uh, you know, Israel has to kill every Palestinian to win this war is like basically what Trump's saying. And you're not a true uh, Jew if you don't vote for him. I mean, it's just it's madness, but he's trying to own that mantle. And meanwhile, you know, is it, is it a terror state? Apparently not now because they have just gave him a gazillion dollars to help his social media company. And we don't know what kind of deals are going on. We know the TikTok seems very suspicious given who has given him money. So these are national security threats. But again, the exposure is good. But if you asked me, how would I hope most people spend their time? It is getting 10 people to the polls because that's going to be faster and it's going to be more decisive, right? If he loses, it's going to be more decisive. If he comes in with those kinds of of national security transactional commitments, our national security will be for sale. We know that now. But it was before, I mean, it was when he was president. I mean, that's almost where I wanted to end with you, which is this is kind of the stuff that if you were looking at foreign election interference, if you were looking at you know, a blind spot. I mean, Mueller, you know, in 2017 found that the Russian government interfered in the 2016 election. We knew the Senate Intelligence Committee investigation was perfectly clear about Paul Manafort and his connection to the Kremlin. So there's a weird way in which, and and I don't understand it, it's some form of, I guess, weird sort of myopic American... um, exceptionalism that's like, oh, sure, everyone in the world wants to interfere in our elections and all the oligarchs are putting all the money into it. But let's be mad at Merrick Garland. Yeah, that's I mean, it, it, it makes no sense to me. You know, you know, kudos to all those people who believe in the rule of law. And I believe in the rule of law, obviously. But this is an ideological battle. It's not a legal battle. The law is a tool to help win the ideological battle. And that's, I mean, that's what I wrote on January 11th. Every single piece, all the cases, all the exposures, all the isolation, the never Trump movement, all 10,000 swords against this guy. Um, But none of them will be decisive. I mean, the only thing that's going to be decisive is is in November. Um, So focus. I just want to point out that when you were talking about your wish list for what President Biden does in the event of 
you know, hanky panky around the election. You said, I hope he takes the states to court. And so it is this interplay, right? It's always going to be that one of those swords you're talking about is the courts, but the idea that it's the only thing or that we're going to get to watch him lose spectacularly in a criminal case that ends on October 31st. That's the thing that's delusional. Is this a legal fight against Trump or is it a counterterrorism fight against Trump? And terrorist movements weaken. Ideologies don't die. We know that about Nazism. Ideologies don't die. They weaken because they're shamed. They're isolated. They're prosecuted. You can't get jobs. You're banished from various things for a variety of reasons. It's the it's that combination Uh, that the Republicans had it in them to do. I want to say this every single time. There were windows when they could have done this. And their weakness in doing that puts a lot of pressure on the law. And I don't think the legal cases can deliver in the way that a counterterrorism strategy can. And yes, I believe Trump is the leader of a terrorist movement. He's also the leader of a political movement. And the more that we align those and make it clear to people You can't get one without the other. The more confident I become that there will be a decisive moment in November. Juliet Kayam is a national leader in homeland security and crisis management. She's the Robert and Renee Belfer Senior Lecturer and Faculty Chair of the Homeland Security and Security and Global Health Projects at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. She also served as President Obama's Assistant Secretary for Intergovernmental Affairs at the Department of Homeland Security. She is a security analyst for CNN, contributor to The Atlantic, and her most recent book, The Devil Never Sleeps, Learning to Live in an Age of Disasters, was published in 2022, and she is off to take a nap. Before we go, we have some exciting news for Slate Plus members. We're upgrading your subscriber benefits. So starting today, we're going to be giving you weekly, weekly bonus episodes. And whereas up till now, Mark and I have been kind of sliding into the Slate Plus cigar bar that was kind of actually in a shed at the end of the garden of the regular episode, from now on, we'll meet you in a custom-built, climate-controlled, and softly lit Amicus Plus Cigar Bar, a.k.a. This is a bonus episode all of your own. These bonus episodes will be the new home for all the extra stuff that we can't fit into the main show and other subscriber exclusive content like our emergency episodes during Opinion Palooza. And of course, you'll still be able to listen to this show and all your other favorite Slate podcasts ad free. The new standalone bonus episodes will help more people find and access our subscriber content, and that helps us keep the studio lights on. Thank you. This week's Amicus Plus episode is a deep dive on what the hell Florida's Supreme Court is up to with its multiple abortion rulings this week. It's about the South Carolina racial gerrymander that the Supreme Court is allowing to just slide into place in time for the next election. And, of course, Clarence Thomas's home finishing school for extremist young jurists. You can listen right now by joining Slate Plus. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts by clicking Try Free at the top of our show page or visit Slate.com forward slash Amicus Plus to get access wherever you listen. The episode is available to you to listen to right now, and I'll see you there. And that is a wrap for this episode of Amicus. Thank you so much for listening in. Thank you so much for your letters and your comments and your questions. You can always keep in touch at amicus at slate.com or find us at facebook.com slash amicus podcast. Sarah Burningham is Amicus's senior producer. Our producer is Patrick Fort. Alicia Montgomery is Vice President of Audio at Slate. Susan Matthews is Slate's Executive Editor. And Ben Richmond is our Senior Director of Operations. We'll be back with another episode of Amicus next week. And until then, hang on in there. When we made our McDonald's Spicy Chicken McNuggets, you were praise hands emoji. Then we ran out and you were streaming tears emoji. Now they're back, so you can be grinning face with sweat emoji. Order ahead on the McDonald's app. And get money mouth face emoji with two orders of crispy, irresistible 10-piece McNuggets. Spicy or classic for just $6.
Limited time only. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Single item at regular price. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. The winner is... Slow Burn Becoming Justice Thomas. Congratulations to Joel Anderson and the entire team behind Slow Burn Becoming Justice Thomas on their win for Podcast of the Year at the 2024 Ambies Awards. First of all, thanks to the Academy, thanks to the many fans and supporters of the podcast, um, especially the people that subscribe to Slate Plus. We can't do work without money and people that care about the work that we do. So really helpful to, <laughs> to be able to go places like show up in Savannah, Georgia, at Justice Thomas's mother's house. You know what I'm saying? We do that with the money we make through Slate Plus. Join Slate Plus for a behind the scenes look at the making of the season and other member exclusive episodes. Subscribe now by clicking Try Free at the top of the Slow Burn show page on Apple Podcasts or visit slate.com forward slash Slow Burn Plus to get access wherever you listen.